Welcome, welcome. Thank you all for joining us today. This is Samantha. Um, just to let you guys know, there is a box. If you have questions, feel free to type in any questions. Uh, we'll be answering them throughout the webinar. Just wanted to give you guys a couple minutes to get registered. I do see quite a few people on here. Uh, oh, hey, Bill. Hey, Bill from Florida. Oh, there's a lot of them coming in. Yeah, it looks like people are still signing up. So we're going to give it just a couple minutes. We have Sandra from Maine. Oh, there's someone from California. Ty. Good, good. Okay, should we give it a couple minutes? Yeah, okay. All right, looks like we have quite a few people still logging into the webinar. We're going to give it a couple minutes, and we'll be right back with you guys. All right, everybody, we are back. Um, looks like we have quite a few people with us now. Um, so everybody's got registered, signed up, and on. Hopefully you can see the presentation. Uh, just as a little reminder, there is a toolbar off to the side, to the right side. If you guys want to type in questions, you please feel free to ask questions throughout the webinar. Uh, we'll be able to monitor. I'm going to be monitoring the questions. We'll be able to answer them real time for you here. So don't hesitate. Yes, thank you all for joining us today. So we'll get started. Uh, but first off, I'd like to introduce Joe Bell. He's the senior market strategist here at Schaefer's. Um, we've had the pleasure of having Joe with us now for 10 years. So I'm going to give him just a minute to give a brief introduction and tell us about himself. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha. Uh, as she said, I've been at Schaefer's for about a little over 10 years now. Um, I'm a senior market strategist. I work with equity and option strategies, but I not just by myself. We have a, a really good experienced team here, a group of us that work together. We do equity and option portfolios, various strategies, uh, newsletters, written content, some media commentary, print and television, along with educational presentations and webinars like these. So let's go ahead and get to the actual presentation itself why we don't care when the bull market ends. It sounds um, kind of like an interesting statement, but let me sort of, instead of tackling that right away, let me sort of shift into a quote to talk about exactly how we got here, why we sort of thought of this theme for this presentation. So the quote, the longer the stock market goes up, the more clients ask when it will go down. Questions about the timing of the next 8% or 10% decline in the S&P 500 outnumber other inquiries. Now this is a quote from a Bloomberg article uh, recently just a few weeks ago and just from talking to Samantha and some of our uh, client facing um, positions here at Schaefer's it seems like something a lot of our subscribers, a lot of our customers and just a lot of people in general continue to wonder. We've been in an extremely strong bull market but I think there's still a little bit of fear out there or uncertainty about 
when will the next decline happen and how should I be positioned? So we thought, okay, let's sort of tackle this and go into depth to sort of introduce our approach and how we look at the market and what tools we think are important to sort of navigate this market going forward. So as I mentioned, let me first just take a step back and for people that aren't familiar with our approach, uh, we like to call it expectational analysis. And the key part of that word expectational analysis is expectations. Um, we look for stocks on the long side that have low expectations where that bar has been set low. And we, we use a three-prong approach. And the first part is something I think is widely talked about. It's pretty much what most uh, business programs and college finance degrees, it's what they teach a lot of, fundamental analysis. And some of the key tenets is valuation, how much is the actual company or stock worth, economic and industry forecasts, what, what do you expect from this company, um, how strong have sales been, how strong have revenues and profits been, how long do you forecast that into the future given the economic environment. You take a look at financial statements, income statements, cash flow statements, balance sheets, how much debt, how much equity, how much cash is the company generating, and you look similar to what you would do if you were going to buy a business down the street, whether it be a gas station or any other kind of business, you want to look at see how much do you think it's worth relative to what you think the future earnings for that company is. So future growth, and then the, the ultimate question, what we're always asking is, is it a good investment based on all these factors? Now the second part of our approach is technical analysis. Fundamental analysis is very very powerful and over the long term it's very important, but technical analysis is really good at timing, especially when you're looking at shorter term trends. And I put that term, it is priced in, because that, that's really at the tenet of technical analysis. It's the study of price and volume, supply and demand, and the ultimate theory that, okay, whatever that current price is, that is the ultimate determinant of what all the buyers in the market, all the sellers in the market, that's ultimately what that stock has been priced in given all the information I just discussed, valuation, financial statements, future growth, what is the actual price? And at the end of the day, there's a term price is what pays, and that's true. So we like to look for trends, patterns, indicators. There's a lot of them. That could be a whole presentation on its own, but there's a ton of those that we look at to look at the timing for specific trades, whether it be the overall market, sectors, or individual stocks. And then finally, sort of our little niche, the third part of our approach, and it's, it's very powerful sentiment analysis. It's emotions and herd mentality. And it's sort of at the, uh, when you think of supply and demand, and I talk about buyers and sellers, at the root of the, the buying and the selling are humans. So what is the emotions? What is the sentiment? What is the consensus opinion? And we, we like to say we are contrarians because oftentimes, and we'll see it on the next slide, we're going to go over a quote here um, that kind of talks about it. Um, you'll see very, very positive sentiment during major market tops and you're going to see very pessimistic negative sentiment toward major market bottoms. And we at Schaefer's, we really like to sort of um, use a wealth of indicators, whether it's qualitative or quantitative. That's kind of what we do is we, we really try to get a, a very large list of indicators to really quantify what exactly is the sentiment of this market. And we sort of combine it all together to analyze the market as a whole. So this is the quote that I mentioned. The crowd is most enthusiastic and optimistic when it should be cautious and prudent and is most fearful when it should be bold. And that's from Humphrey B. Neal. He was an author of a book titled The Art of Contrary Thinking. And the sentence sort of defines almost every major stock market bubble or major market bottom, whether it is the real estate bubble in 2007-2008 or the tech bubble or the major market bottom most recently in March 2009. So as I talked about sentiment and you see the overwhelming amount of optimism, I'm going to get a little help from Will Farrell from the anchor man, Ron Burgundy character here. And it may seem humorous at first, but what he's showing is really human emotion and it's what all investors display. Um, whether it's joy from something in your personal life or stock market making money. So you see that same behavior, that same emotion during market tops. And as I mentioned before, real estate back in 2007, 2008, um, real estate prices across the board almost irrelevant of what market or location. Everything was going up. Everybody thought they could make money. Um, so you get that euphoria where sentiment polls are over the top bullish. Um, everybody's an expert. You see things like that. And eventually you have a little bit of 
of a decline because that that buying dries up a little bit and you reach that disbelief stage. Now, we call it disbelief because you, you might get a decline in the market, but most people would say, okay, this is just a buying opportunity. This is a just a pullback. Eventually, once that supply starts to hit the market it, with even more volume, we reach the acceptance stage where, okay, everybody sort of agrees that we're in a bear market now. The actual contrarians at this point are people that's saying, okay, not everything's that bad, but the majority of people, whether you see it on TV or you look at forecast, all the surveys, the forecast, Wall Street sell side analysts, everybody is decidedly bearish during this time. And this is the longest part of the downtrend would be the acceptance phase because that's when most of the money is flowing off to the sidelines. And eventually that leads to despair. And it's turning green because that it, it seems like the worst part of the market cycle and it usually is. It's extremely high volatility. Everybody is panicking. You see people pulling money out of their long-term retirement accounts because they would rather stay in cash. You see the market headlines. You see non business related media magazine covers and television stations talking about the market and how bad it is. And at some point this type of selling becomes exhausted and it becomes an actual good buying opportunity. And I won't go through every single phase on the way up but briefly here because it, the, the dynamics are very similar but basically we move into the disbelief stage where most people believe it's a what they call a dead cat bounce. We're still in a bear market don't buy here and we experienced all of this during the major market bottom in 2009. Eventually we reach once again and you'll hear it once we enter it the trend is your friend the trend continues and that's where the most money is made that's where all the money is flowing back off the sidelines and eventually we reach euphoria once again and the common denominator from all of this is that at the end of the day it's human behavior human emotions and we as Schaefer's are trying to quantify indicators to sort of identify where we are at in this cycle. So that leads what we're talking about. We said why we don't care when the bull market ends. Let's talk about it. Where are we now? Obviously, we all know we're in a bull market. We're less than 3% from all-time highs. When we take a look at it from a technical perspective, most of the major moving averages are trending upward. We continue to make higher highs and higher lows. When you look at the past six to eight weeks, the market has sort of trudged along, and maybe there's been a slight pullback. We've had a lot of different reasons, whether it be North Korea or geopolitical or political reasons. Different things have hit the market, but when you just look at price, I think it's held up pretty well overall. Interest rates. There's no doubt we're in a low interest rate environment. Uh, the talk has obviously been that the Fed has began raising rates. We've had two interest rate hikes so far this year. When you look at most expectations, most would probably expect there to be at most one more, maybe the December meeting, but some expectations are already starting to think that, that that perhaps may not happen until early 2018. And that's an interesting one because for the longest time, it, it's sort of a good example of how expectations, a lot of people thought that this was a Fed-fueled rally. When you look back three or four years ago, everybody said this was a Fed-induced bubble. And it's now been seven or eight years, and a lot of that money, we looked at that as a healthy dose of skepticism and a healthy dose of fear, which at some point translated to money that was coming from the sidelines back into the market. So PE, price to earnings ratio near 24 on the S&P 500. This is high. There's, there's no two ways around it. When you look at valuations, they're high. The key thing, and I'll touch on it here in a little bit when we, look, we talk about our outlook, is valuations are good long-term indicators looking out five to eight to ten years longer term. As a timing tool, it's not always that great. This P-E ratio has been high for at least two years now. So valuations are high. I would put that in the category as being a risk, but I wouldn't put it as a right here, right now indicator of us going, um, seeing any sort of a major pullback right here, right now. Corporate profits are strong. We talk about fundamentals. The S&P 500 component companies turned the corner from negative earnings growth to positive the first quarter of 2016, and they really have never looked back. Uh, we've, we've seen consistent positive quarters. The second quarter of 2017, profits have continued to be very strong, and that's continued to be an underlying strength for this overall market. Slow economic growth. When you look at back over the past 60 to 80 years, GDP growth has averaged about 3.25%. Um, during this bull market recovery, we have seen only just, just slightly north of 2%. So 
we have seen slow but consistent economic growth, but by no means extremely strong relative to historical standards. And sentiment. When you talk about sentiment, there's obviously we're not in that despair stage or even perhaps that disbelief stage. Maybe we're somewhere in that acceptance stage. We've seen short interest on S&P 500 components decline dramatically um, over the past few years. So that's at a low level. But when we continue to look at forecasts, uh, when we look at fund manager positioning, cash levels are still very high. Um, you look at expectations for fund managers globally. Um, 46% on the most recent Bank of America Merrill Lynch poll are looking for a pullback in the next 12 months. So I would say sentiment has, still has a healthy dose of skepticism going forward. So that's where we are now within the bull market. But the question is going forward, even within a longer term uptrend fundamentally or technically, you're going to see three to five to 10% pullbacks. And that doesn't necessarily mean that we've entered a, a bear market just yet. So we could see sideways price action. We could see a blow off top here and then a reversal back down. There's a lot of different scenarios. And so the question is what tools do we need going forward? Why does it necessarily not, is it not the end just because we get a pullback? And at Shavers, we focus a lot on options. And that's one of the keys we think when you look at options as a tool for this market, regardless of what happens over the next six or 12 months. Um, and for, I, would, I just want to kind of go through some of the benefits of these option strategies. Uh, low cost of entry. When you look at options, they are derivative, which means their price and value derive themselves from the underlying stock. So each stock, and this is important, each stock that, each option rather, one contract represents 100 shares of the underlying stock. So you're going to pay a fraction of the price that you would to enter a long position or a short position in that underlying stock. So what's that mean? Obviously a low cost of entry, but it gives you incredible leverage. You are able to get three to five to 10, 10 to one leverage on these option positions because your cost of entry is so much lower than it would cost. And we're gonna show a couple examples of just how much that low cost of entry can translate to, to major profit potential for an option relative to just buying a stock. And with that low cost of entry, it gives you limited risk. And this sort of all ties within each other. You look at leverage, um, you can leverage and gain more than 100%. When you're buying options, you're limited risk to what you pay for that option. So you can only lose 100%, but you are able to gain multiples of that depending on the aggressiveness of your strategy. So. I would put that as a benefit. You know exactly what your risk is. It's very well defined. And in most option strategies, you have the ability to earn more than your maximum possible loss. And then finally, flexibility. And I think this is probably, with regard to our, our conversation today, might be one of the most important ones. Um, when you're talking about a market and you have a fear of, are we going to see a five or 10% pullback? With stocks, you pretty much can go long stocks or you can short stocks. With options, you have a variety of strategies that give you the ability to profit regardless of price behavior. We're gonna to touch on a few of those today, but there are a lot of them that can profit from sideways price action, big volatility, small volatility, declines in market, major continuations of uptrends. So the flexibility is one of the major benefits for options. So the first type of option strategy, and I would say it's basic, but it's also at the root of every other option strategy. You have calls and puts, and let's start with calls. A call options, and I just put them here. It's pretty, they can be complicated, but if you understand the basics, especially if you're new to options, um, I think it's pretty intuitive as well. A call option, it's a bet on a stock going higher. So if you normally would want to buy a stock to trade, you can buy a call option on that stock instead. For that option, you're going to pay a premium, but again, it's going to be a fraction of the price compared to buying those shares. And this goes back to the fact that one contract gives you exposure to the movement of 100 shares of stock. So that, that ability to pay a fraction of the price compared to buying shares can be very powerful for your trading portfolio, depending on how much money you have to invest. And then really the flexibility, you can choose how aggressive you want to be uh, in the money, at the money, out of the money options. 
Um, we, we don't have time necessarily to get into all the intricacies of these specific types, but just to understand it, if, if you're new to this, you really have the choice of how aggressive you want to be. Do you want more leverage? Do you want to risk more for a bigger reward? Or do you want to be a little more conservative? Um, so that flexibility is very powerful for calls. And let's go ahead and give an example. Sam, as she mentioned, Sam's going to uh, monitor those questions. So keep them coming. It looks like we had a few different questions about call options. Um, Sam, what, what do you see there? Yeah, we actually have a, quite a few people asking similar questions, so we'll cover this one if you don't mind, Joe. Uh, they're asking, isn't it risky to buy calls with stocks near highs? That's a good question. Um, short answer, it could be. It really depends. When, when we talk about call options, it depends what individual stock you're buying. Um, one of the benefits, and I'm, I'm going back to it, but it really is, you, you have an amount when you enter the call position you know exactly how much your your potential maximum loss is. Your losses are limited to your premium you pay. And remember, that premium you pay is going to be a fraction of the amount that you're going to buy if you wanted to go along the shares. And with that being also said, we talk about the bull market, but underneath the surface, there are always going to be winners and losers when you dial down within the stock market. We talk about the S&P 500 being less than 3% off all-time highs. But within the S&P 500, you have 10 sectors, hundreds of different um, industries and thousands of different stocks and within all of those you're going to see a lot of winners and losers and we like to sort of dial down and use our expectational analysis to find those winners and losers and then use options overlaid with our analysis to sort of create the most bang for a buck when we sort of uh, predict the, the stock and its outlook correctly. So hopefully that answers your question. It's, it's a broad question, and it, it kind of depends on what you're investing in. And options come down to, just like stock trading, it comes down to what is your outlook and then applying the right option strategy to that specific stock at the right time. So timing is going to be important. There's no doubt about that. So here, here's a good example of uh, First Solar. This was Some of these are examples of trades we did. And it's not necessarily to pat ourselves on the back and say this is the big winner. It's, it's more just to show you the type of leverage and an example in real-time trading in one of our real-time services for our clients, what type of, what we're talking about when we look at the cost of entry and how that leverage can work in real time. So this was a first solar. The solar energy stocks as a sector have been red hot, but first solar was one of the leaders of the pack. It was up almost 20% year to date following a strong earnings report. Um, when you look at the entry here, the first thing we want to talk about, we recommended a December 3750 strike call. The stock cost, if you wanted to buy 100 shares, say you, you did your analysis. When we, when we looked at First Solar, we saw the strong fundamentals that were improving, the technical breakout against the previous resistance. Um, short sellers were down 30% the previous month, yet they were still at almost 18%, which is a, a sign of pessimism. And that kind of goes back to our analysis we talked about. It was a stock whose fundamentals were improving, the technicals looked bright, and yet we still saw a lot of doubters. So that was our analysis, but just looking at the options sort of separate from that. Just if you wanted to go long the stock when we entered it, the stock cost was nearly $3,900. The option cost for the exposure to the movement of that stock only cost $565. Now, after this was initiated, the stock, we were correct. The, the outlook was right. The timing was pretty good. We had, we had a little bit of a pullback, but overall, during the time frame for that option, we got a stock return of 27% off of that technical breakout that we were looking for. Now, you can see the, the kind of leverage that paying that lower premium relative to the stock return. It was a 27% stock return with an option return of 112%. So incredible leverage on a stock move. And that, that's one of the benefits of options overall. So the opposite, and just to kind of keep this simple, especially if you're new to this, call option is a bet on a stock going higher. Now a put option is the complete opposite. It's a bet on a stock going lower. But a lot of the benefits remain the same. You're going to pay a premium, and that premium is going to be a fraction of the price compared to shorting shares. And again, that ultimate flexibility, and I, and I want to hammer that home because when you're in a bull market like we have been, and it starts to get where there's that little bit of unsettling, when is that, that pullback going to happen? How large is it going to happen? Put options give you the flexibility to potentially profit from any pullback, and you have the flexibility, depending on your risk tolerance, what is your risk appetite, 
how aggressive do you want to be? How leveraged do you want to be? There, there's a lot of flexibility, and that's one of the benefits. Lower premiums, a lot of flexibility, depending on your outlook. And Joe, we have a, another question here, a couple similar questions about the puts. Um, they're asking, do you use puts as a hedge? As a hedge, that that is probably the most commonly thought of question. When when you when you see puts, people think of them as a hedge. And we talked about the the market being an uptrend. And, and the short answer is yes, you can use them as a hedge. There's a lot of portfolio managers, a lot of fund managers that manage a lot of money, and there are several reasons you want to do. Whether it's to avoid a potential long-term capital gains tax, you can buy out of the money puts if you think perhaps that that stock position or your portfolio is going to hit a bit of a rough patch but you don't necessarily want to close that position out you may want to buy puts instead to capitalize on a per potential pullback without closing out that position so that's one way to look at it another way to look at it is you just have identified specific stocks and that's an example we're about to go over is a specific stock within the oil and gas industry in a dark and petroleum you may use this to speculate on specific industries and sectors or stocks to profit from your outlook on those as well. So the answer is yes, it can be used as a hedge. It can also be used as a tool for speculation. So the answer is both. As I mentioned, the uh, Anadarka Petroleum, this example, was back in February, the beginning of February, February 1st. As you can see, this was actually a pretty good long-term uptrend, Anadarka Petroleum. But you can also see with the blue lines near the top of the chart a trading range that it had been in for about the first couple months later parts of 2016 into 2017. And it had broke that. And it had not only broke that, it had a, a couple days before that break of the lower trend line trading channel and also below the, the moving average, the company had reported earnings a loss of 50 cents per share that was actually below expectations. So remember we talked about those on the downside, those high expectations can, can really be a big speed bump. And in this case, we saw a technical break of a former support area on a stock that had been in a relatively strong uptrend on a worse than expected fundamental event. And when we took a look at the analysts, all the analysts loved it. About 80% of the analysts recommended buying the stock. Um, and really when you looked at the price action, it goes back to technical analysis, it's priced in. We saw a stock reacting very negatively to a fundamental event and breaking below a former support area and it was surrounded with a lot of positive sentiment. And we did the May 70 put, so in this case it was about three months out. And with the stock around 69, 60, $68, the, the 70 strike put, a bet on it going down and you can see the stock cost first option cost again it's very glaring six thousand seven hundred and eighty nine dollars if you wanted to short the shares if you wanted to bet on that stock going down it would cost you six thousand seven hundred eighty nine dollars plus the cost of margin which is not even calculated within this but it would be even more option cost would be five hundred and seventeen dollars so for just a fraction of the price you get exposure to the bet of the stock going down in this case, the stock went down 16% the first two months. The option was up 152%. And within this specific trade example, we actually took some profits off the table at this, at this juncture. But the stock actually ultimately, during the full life of the option, returned 24% to the downside, which was the bet with, remember, the put is the stock, the bet on the stock going down, you, you see, very incredible leverage, 259%. So whatever your analysis, we like to focus on expectational analysis, but whatever analysis you use, it's it's still pretty incredible the, the type of leverage that you can get on the option return versus the stock return for this bet. And finally, the, the last strategy, and then we're going to jump over to market outlook and sectors and kind of tell you what we're seeing right now as well. But the, the final tool, and this is an important one, these are, we're kind of outlining three strategies. There's a lot more strategies that we do here at Schaefer's, but I think for the purposes of this presentation, these are three that are very useful to the current market environment. So we have bets on it going up with calls, bets on it going down with puts, and straddles are sort of a hybrid between both of those. You can bet on the stock going higher or lower. So 
by doing this, you're going to buy a call and a put. And since you're buying a call and a put, you're going to pay for two premiums, same stock, same strike, same expiration. So it's sort of the little tagline that we use when we're talking to people that are somewhat unfamiliar with straddles. It says two ways to win, only one way to lose. So obviously every strategy is going to have a risk and reward. This specific strategy is bet on volatility, a big move up or down. You don't necessarily care which way it moves, especially if you're playing at the money options. Um, so you have two ways to win, a bet going up or down. Obviously if it goes sideways would be your risk. But the ultimate win on this and when you would apply this strategy is if you're in a market where you think perhaps you're going to get a big move up or a big move down. And that could be on the broad market like the S&P 500. That could be on a specific sector you're looking at or that could be on individual stocks. In the example, we're actually going to use the ETF. And this is TLT, the 20-year treasury bond. This was back in February, late February 24th. Uh, you can see as signified by the blue lines on the bottom right part of the chart, it was forming what we would call a symmetrical triangle pattern where it was making lower highs and higher lows and sort of coiling. And you kind of see that even if you're not familiar with a lot of technical analysis, you can kind of see how the price is coiling there. We also saw options. The options were very cheap. They were cheaper than 22%. They were, they were at their lowest levels they were cheaper than 78% rather, I'm sorry, 78% of the options that we had looked at on the TLT over the past year. So options were cheap. The stock was coiling here. We saw a lot of reason based on our analysis. Um, there was also near record short positioning on 10 year futures and a little bit of a breakout. So all of our drivers we looked at signified that perhaps this was going to make a big break to the upside or downside and that the coiling, the volatility was going to spike. So we did a March 10, 2017 121.50 strike straddle and that remember is buying two options you're buying a 121.50 call and a 121.50 put and you're buying them together and you can see it only cost $246 for access to 100 shares the individual ETF was trading for $122 so if you bought 100 shares for that obviously it was going to be um, way more expensive to sort of get exposure to the stock but the important thing with the straddle you really can't get exposure to this sort of setup just buying stock if you're going to buy a stock and short a stock that's a net zero position so the straddle is sort of different than the call and the put and that this is a strategy that you can actually not really even have access to by just trading stocks or shorting stocks this gives you access to up or down movement so it's the ultimate flexibility for the strategy so another example of the sort of leverage that we see here, the TLT actually broke down. Although you can see when the trade was initiated, it was at the top of that range, we saw a strong gap down and then ultimately a runaway gap to the downside. The straddle returned 77% with only less than a 4% return to the downside of TLT. So incredible leverage here on a negative 3.7% return, the straddle, bet on the stock going up or down, in this case an ETF, 77%. So you can see the type of leverage and in this case the, the type of flexibility that this option strategy can give you in real time when you're, when you're making your decisions on positions, whether it be like I said, in this case it was the, the bond market, not just a, a sector or a stock. Okay, before I jump into market outlook, I think uh, Sam was kind of flagging me down here. I think there was a few questions about volatility especially when you're talking about straddles yeah most certainly we actually have had quite a few in this segment um, one of them that jumps out is do you guys look at the VIX for trading how would a spike in the VIX affect the option trades if you could field that one for us sure the VIX for those that aren't familiar with it let me just give a very very brief overview it's basically a volatility index that looks at the option premiums for all the options of the 500 stocks in the S&P 500. And people kind of look at it as sort of an overall gauge for how expensive volatility is and what are the expectations for volatility over say the next 30 or 40 trading days. What is the market's expectation for volatility? So the short answer is yes, especially when you talk about different option strategies. Straddles, you're paying two premiums. So I actually mentioned it in the example. 
we'll not only look at the VIX, the VIX is obviously a broader market volatility index. When we're trading individual stocks, we actually have an internal indicator where we actually calculate all of the volatilities, the implied volatilities of not only the individual stocks, but the sectors as well. So we actually dial down even a little bit deeper to look for options that are cheap or options that are expensive because we haven't covered these today, but there are even option strategies where you're selling premium and collecting income on a consistent basis. So there's a lot of flexibility, a lot of different strategies depending on your outlook. VIX, yes, we pay attention to it for a market indicator, but we also look at it when you're talking about identifying what types of option strategies you think are going to work in what types of markets. So again, it's a, it's a key component to the pricing of options. So it's something we look at not only on the, the big level, the overall market, we look at it on the sector level and the stock level. So we actually dial down even deeper into the individual stocks than the broad market VIX does. So let's take a look at the market outlook. We're gonna run through this and I'll jump into the sectors a little, little further deeper. The trend remains in place. I think the, the market has not indicated any signs of breaking just yet. We've had a little bit of consolidation here, a, a slight pullback, if you will, the past six weeks, but the, the major uptrend remains in place. Also, fiscal infrastructure policy. Uh, it, this stuff is hard to predict, obviously. The markets are tough enough to predict. Washington sometimes is often even way more difficult. But when you talk about what is the market's reaction to potential news out of Washington, coming post-presidential election, there was a lot of talk about fiscal policy and tax reductions, corporate tax reductions, infrastructure policy. We really haven't seen these, and I think the transition from say six to eight months ago until today is there's actually a lot of doubt and a lot of potential skepticism toward these policies. So if we get any sort of policy that is positive for the market from these two factors, I think that could be a, a potential boost. And that sort of relates back to what I was talking about as far as expectations. I think expectations for these types of policies has been ratcheted down quite a bit the past six or eight months. So I think any sort of upside surprise for these could be a boost for the market. Valuations, I talked about this previously. The market, there's no doubt valuations are high. Historically, longer term indicators, not necessarily good timing tools. Um, over the short term, valuations have been high for two or three years. So again, a risk, but not necessarily a something to panic about right here, right now. And one of the good things about this market is we've actually, like I mentioned, we've, we've seen strong, consistent corporate earnings growth, and I think we're going to continue to see mid to high single digit earnings growth. The trend is, is very good. And then room for more optimism. I talk about earnings growth. Corporate profits have been pretty strong. Economic growth has been slower than normal. Um, we, but, I, but I think that slow growth could mean a more sustainable for a longer period of time. There's a lot of factors, and this is a bigger picture uh, thought, but millennials just overpassed the baby boomer generation, and they're now reaching family formation years. They haven't really had that high of a risk appetite for stocks yet. They have been primarily savers, and they haven't really bought homes yet. And entering their family formation years, that, that's something we'll, we'll see. We've seen some indications that maybe they're going to buy homes but at a, at a faster pace, but perhaps that's one more way to add growth to this economy that we really haven't seen. But, but I really think, going back to the major point, I think that slow earnings growth long term, maybe it means this economic cycle lasts a little longer than some of those previous economic cycles that were not this 2.2, 2.3, were actually 3.2, 3.3, so they went a little faster. But I think maybe slow and steady could mean longer expansion. And then room for optimism. I mentioned it earlier. We continue to see skepticism, cash levels high from fund managers, short interest on components still relatively high. And then even recently, a new August poll, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, we saw 46% of fund managers believe the market is overvalued. And we also just saw the longest streak of outflows from US equity funds since 2004. So there's still some, I think a healthy bit of fear in this market. It just doesn't really compare to some of those major market tops like the real estate or the tech boom or even some of the, the ones before those times, it, we, it just really does not compare from a sentiment perspective. 
so within this market, what sectors do we like? First, basic materials and some of the industries, I'll point out gold miners, chemicals and metals. Technically, and this is probably probably every sector in the market besides energy right now, it's in a pretty strong uptrend. Um, the US dollar continues to underperform in 2017, down nearly 10%. That usually runs inverse and is pretty strong for these dollar denominated basic materials. Infrastructure spending, we haven't got it. Maybe we get it late this year or sometime in 2018. That might be a boost for this sector as well. In recent development, gold and gold miners broke out this week from a, a pretty long held consolidation pattern. So gold miners and gold within that sector of basic materials showing some strength. I think all that together with the fact that fundamentally quarter two, 80% of the sector beat on second quarter revenue expectations. When you look at fundamentally, technically, and then some of those sentiment indicators we look at, I think basic material stands to outperform here. Healthcare, some of the same basic methodology we're looking at, but within healthcare, biotech and healthcare companies, we've seen some strong M&A activity recently. Uh, biotech had a pretty healthy pullback after a, an, ex, an incredible run here in early 2017. And I think, again, uncertainty around Obamacare and the healthcare industry as a whole, we always at Schaefer's look at uncertainty as potential opportunities. So any healthcare law changes over the next few years might create clarity um, in a situation where there right now might be uncertainty. Any kind of clarity is always good for stock markets. And again, from a fundamental standpoint, we're on the heels of the quarter two earnings reports, 81% of the companies in the sector beat earnings. That was the second highest beat rate of all sectors. So fundamentally and technically looking very strong healthcare. And then finally, this is the uh, last but not least, and I say that because it's been the real leader in this market. It's up probably more than 20% year to date. So in the strong bull market, technology has been the strongest and that's not necessarily a, a bad sign. That's usually a good thing. It's not the first one you wanna necessarily point out for a bearish trade on a stock that's the leader. Um, despite that leadership, we continue to see bearish option activity and a healthy dose of negative sentiment surrounding this sector. And fundamentally, it's had the second highest year-over-year -year earnings growth from all the sectors we look at within the S&P 500 at plus 14.7%. And within that sector, it has very strong breadth from a fundamental perspective. Five out of seven of the industries showed positive growth from a year-over-year -year earnings growth perspective. So fundamentally looking strong, price action continues to be the leader in this market. So those are three sectors we think would be positioned pretty good over the next six or 12 months. Now let's kind of shift back and sort of wrap this up. And Sam's gonna sort of highlight some of these special offers we've put together here. We do have a preference in the chat box. I believe, is it Sam, it's, is it the question section that they have? Right, correct. So if you guys have additional questions, continue to type them in the chat box. Um, we will be monitoring that and also will be available after the webinar. So we can do a one-on-one -on -one call if necessary, if you have additional questions that you want addressed off on your own. Um, so we, like Joe said, we do have a couple uh, specials just for you logging into the webinar here. Um, I don't know if we mentioned it in the beginning, we actually celebrated 36 years, uh, so the 36th anniversary here for Schaefer, so they're offering some great deals. Uh, rather than 12 months of service, you actually get 36 months, so it's 12 months by 12 months, get two years free on any of the packages that we're offering today. Um, and one of the things people come here to Schaefer's for is trade recommendations. I mean, obviously they're looking to make a profit, um, people want to get recommendations. So we have a couple different levels and we'll touch on them. Joe mentioned a little bit. Um, our first level, the silver levels, is more of a basic. It provides ongoing education, daily stock trades, options newsletter, market commentary and trades. This is a package that's designed for the person that's looking for some education, just looking to get started, um, not really sure what they're looking to do yet. Do you want to comment on yeah, and, and that goes back to if, if you're new to options, maybe some of the option stuff we were talking about was a little over your head or it was just something that seemed a little much for you right now, this is really a good step because anytime you're talking about investing in finance, I tell people all the time, family and friends, it's really about learning the terminology, understanding the concepts. Some of the stuff's not extremely complicated once you understand it and this basic level gives people an opportunity to sort of dip their toes in and learn a little bit more 
not only about the stock market and options market, but about how we approach the market. And so from that from that standpoint, Sam, I think it, I think it's a good opportunity, especially this is something you said we normally um, for this price is twelve months is three three years instead of one. So I, I think it's a good mm -hmm. opportunity for people that are that are pretty new to even the stock market in general to learn more before they jump into some of these more sophisticated strategies. Right. So this package is actually valued at around fifteen hundred dollars. We're offering it for the thirty six months right now for three hundred ninety five dollars. So it's a great deal. Um, so that's going to be more of the earn while you learn type of package. The other two packages that we have are gold level and our platinum level. Those are going to be the most popular. Most people come to us because they're very busy, don't have time to necessarily sit in front of the computer and develop their own trade recommendations. So they're looking to somebody that has the time, has the availability, and has the knowledge. Um, and that's exactly what we have. I mean, obviously, I mentioned you've been here with us for 10 years now. We have a great team that's worked with Bernie Schaefer for quite some time, um, quite the reputation here. So we develop real-time trade recommendations, send them out to you via email. Uh, we can also do a text alert. But the thing is, is we're taking all of the guesswork out of it. You guys put a lot of time and thought into these trade recommendations. We're looking at every different indicator mentioned on the call uh, or on the webinar. We're looking at calls. We're looking at puts. We're looking at straddles. Um, so everything you covered, do you want to talk a little bit more about how you guys are developing the trades? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, at the popular and then even the platinum level, this is um, we we do written commentary and we help out with the education and the the daily stock trades um, as a strategist here and then amongst the team that I work with. But sort of our bread and butter and what we're doing all day. A lot of you aren't necessarily full time stock traders. Maybe you you're a doctor or you have a an occupation that is sort of your passion or something you're going in. Well, us as a team, we're sitting in front of the, these computers and these screens all day, and that's what we're doing for eight, ten hours a day is just looking at the market. Even when we're home, we're just keeping an eye on it at all times and looking for opportunities. Um, in this package in general, it'll give you really access to the three strategies that we talked about, the long-term calls and puts and then event-based calls and puts. We talked a lot about earnings reports early in some of the examples and then just fundamental, even geopolitical, a lot of the uncertainty with regard to health care and um, political or geopolitical overseas North Korea there's a lot of events out there that for lack of a better term can sometimes create a lot of fear but a lot of that fear can translate to opportunities so we're constantly monitoring that on a daily hourly minute by minute basis looking for opportunities to give real time and these are real time you're gonna get a trade recommendation in your inbox there's various methods do they get them through email is that the primary way to get them Sam right we actually do email or text okay so yeah, these are real time, and then we we put the, together the trade commentary. So not only do you get the trades, you get really A through Z. What did we see? Why do we think you should trade this? And then we're going to follow up and manage them and say, okay, we're going to tell you when do we think you should take some profits off the table? When do we think the trend that we have predicted has played out? So we're going to manage those um, on the long side and the short side, along with all the strategies. So the popular package has a little bit of everything we talked about today. Right, and the popular package is kind of middle of the road. Um, it gives you a good amount of trades to take advantage of throughout the month, but not going to overwhelm you if you're not ready to jump in full force. This package, if you piece everything together separately that we're offering, it's just under $5,000 uh, for the 12 months. We're offering this for 36 months in honor of the 36th anniversary. So 36 months of service for just $1,495. And then the last package that we're offering, the Platinum Level, this one's actually going to provide about 30 trades or more a month. This is giving you every real-time option buying strategy that we trade. So it's looking at long-term, short-term, low-dollar, aggressive, um, some overnight positions, some straddles, and more. So this is where we're getting into the examples, if you want to talk about that. Yeah, and this will, like, she explained it exactly right. This gives you the ultimate flexibility because... Um, we, we have clients all the time that, that want low dollar options because maybe they don't have a large portfolio to trade and some of the options might be expensive even though like we said options versus stock trading there really is no comparison you're going to pay a lot less for an option versus the hundred shares of stock but for those of you that want even lower dollar options we have a strategy and a service that looks at that we also talked about flexibility different levels of aggressiveness we have different strategies for time frames long term short term how aggressive do you want to be? It, it really is the full package, and it's uh, like it says right there on the first bullet point. It's every real-time option buying strategy that we trade over 30 trades per month that me and my team are just scouring the market to look for, 
and like she said, we're offering the 12 months for um, offering 36 months for less than the 12 month normal price. Right. So if we're looking at all these strategies individually, the price for all of those is just under $10,000 for the year. We're extending the 36th anniversary special, and we're offering that for 36 months for 300. I'm sorry, 3495, 3495 today. So this is going to give you a wide variety of things to trade throughout the month. You're going to have a lot of options. But the most important thing here with package, uh, the gold level and the platinum, is you actually have a representative you can call in and talk to. So you, if you have questions, you're not on your own, you're not just waiting for the next webinar, you can actually call in and talk with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, ask some questions, get help if you need help. Um, but we're here for you. We have a support staff, you have a customer service staff that can answer questions. If you need anything, don't ever hesitate. So just some great specials for attending the webinar. If you guys have questions, we're going to stand by for just a couple more minutes. Go ahead and type them in the bar on the uh, chat. We'll, we'll hang out here, answer some additional questions. If you have questions and want to talk with us offline, though, feel free to give us a call. Otherwise, you can type in the information and we'll give you a call. We'll reach out as soon as the webinar is over. Yeah, as Sam said, go ahead and write your questions in. If we don't touch on them through the audio right now, um, we can definitely respond back to you on an individual basis, question by question. So um, feel free to stay on as long as you want and ask as many questions as you want. Um, we'll go ahead and respond through the chat or through the question window for any questions you have. Um, other than that, I just want to thank everybody who attended. We had a great turnout today. Um, a lot of good questions. We only had time to ask a few of them, but there were many, many more questions than that that were very, very thoughtful, and we'll try to get back to every single one of you. And also remember, just enter your preference for which package you think fits with where you're at and sort of your investment journey here and learning or wanting to understand or really get in, dive into options right now. So we appreciate your time, and thank you very much for attending. Thank you, guys.